You know, normally when I sit down with senators, I remind, I always say, as a Georgian, I used to want two Bulldogs, two Atlanta Braves, and two Falcons to be my pallbearers so they could let me down one last time. When I got to D.C., um, I figured I'd really needed six senators, but I'm just going to let y'all, I'm going to let y'all off the hook on that because I appreciate y'all being here today. Um, bottom line, we've had a lot of discussion today on, <clears throat> you know, on a lot of topics, um, mandatory spending, revenues, all of the different things. Um, but, you know, where should, we, and, and we've had discussions about where should we be making investments? Is it in our people? Is it in, you know, is, is it in our systems? Is it in, is it in defense? You cannot invest in anything if you are broke, right? And I go back, I'm a process guy. I think if you develop a good process, you learn to love that process, the process will love you back. You stay on, you develop a good process. And I go back and I look at the one thing that's a common thread through every single person that has pledged to run for Congress and has been elected. And, and we've, all, we've all said we want to be fiscally responsible. What's standing in the way of us? It is a horrible budget process. It is a process where there are 50 acceptable pathways to failure and about one or two acceptable pathways to success. And so I think one of the things that I would, and I would love to get y'all's opinion on this, is, is we look ahead, how important it, is it that not only do we deal with a fiscal commission, um, as, you, as you have advocated, but let's talk about, you know, as part of that, do you see a budget reform process as being part of that? Because we, we quite candidly, we, we have a, a budget process that yields an aspirational document that's really not ultimately tied to appropriations or tied to um, the authorization, and none of it's tied to the revenue stream. So, Senator Romney, I, I'd start with you on this. What, talk, talk to us a little bit about process reform and how important it is to put a process in place that rewards early success and punishes, you know, and, and punishes late failure so that Congress is incentivized to do the right thing. I'm not going to disagree with you. Uh, I, I'm not, not going to disagree. I, I agree with you that we, we need to have a budget process which follows the law. Uh, and, and finding teeth uh, to make sure that that budget process is followed is going to be a challenge which this commission can take on, among other things. I would note that I don't think process is sufficient. It's necessary, but not sufficient. And I say that because uh, increasingly people have found we can make things mandatory. Both chambers have said, hey, we can put this outside the budget. We can put it as a mandatory spending item. Uh, and now almost 70% of our federal spending is mandatory. It's not part of it. So if we had a perfect budget process, uh, we, we may do a better job taking out some waste and abuse and excess in our spending. Although you saw that as a percentage of the GDP, domestic spending and defense spending is actually going down. Our, our challenge is we have baby boomers, a lot of us. And just recognizing that that presents a real fiscal challenge for us, and we're going to have to deal not just with the process of dealing with our budget, but also dealing with the non-budget, if you will, the non-discretionary items of our spending as well. Mr. So, Chairman, can I just say one thing very quickly to that? Please. We have the budget on the, on the laws right now, Congressional Budget Act 1974. It sets the timeline. It sets it basically April 15th of each year. We're supposed to basically pass a budget resolution. And then, again, by September 30, pass appropriation bills. No teeth. You've heard about no budget, no pay, and all the different things. We've got to find a way to put teeth to the law we have. And if it's not going to be something as draconian as saying we're no budget, no pay, it makes sense to me. Back in West Virginia, if you don't do your work, you don't get paid. And if you do get paid, you've done your work. Pretty simple. But with that, why not have mandatory cuts if we don't do it on time? That's what could be done. And the bottom line is if we don't, uh, I'm trying to preserve Social Security. I got 400,000 people. Out of 1.7 million people in my state, 400,000 depend on Social Security and Medicare. Social Security is their lifeline. Within 10 years, they're going to have a 20% cut. So if Aunt Mary is getting $1,000 a month now, she's going to open the mail and get $800 and say, what in the hell happened? How come you all cut me? I'm trying to preserve that from happening. That's what we should be talking about. How do you preserve the system? Not this. Does he understand? Uh, not that I call. Okay. The guy that was <laughs> screaming back here. Okay. Those people there, they don't want it because, you know, 
his generation may have to have some adjustments made. But anybody 50 and over we've been talking about, we're preserving the system that we have. And they're just they're trying to weaponize it is what they're trying to do. I can't let it happen. You're back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I Thank think, you. I thank, thank you the all. gentleman. Um, and and uh, now